I tell you what, I'm so proud of the growth I've seen in my wife and just growth in spiritually, man, just seeing what God's doing in her. It, it encourages me, and I pray it encourages you, man, because just seeing what God can do through someone who was very shy, who couldn't stand in front of people, and now you see she looks very comfortable doing it. So God can use you no matter what kind of personality you have. Guess what? He can use you if you're willing to say yes, if you're willing to submit and say, I'm willing to grow. Now, sometimes it means it's going to be uncomfortable. But listen, a lot of times being uncomfortable helps us move into a place where we can get comfortable, yeah. right? Because it's showing us places that we need to adjust. So anyway, that's two cents. I'm not going to talk about that today. But if you've got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead, Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9. We're going to launch out of there, and then I'm going to get some water and pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together in your name today. And we come here corporately worshiping you, receiving your word today. Now, Lord, we've given you praise. Now, our heart is, Lord, to be a receiver. We've given, Father, and now we are here to receive, to receive what you have to say, to, to have ears to hear. So, Father, I pray that if anybody here, their ears are deaf and their eyes are blinded to your word, that Holy Spirit that you right now just open up revelation to them as the Spirit, as the Word comes forth, that Spirit of God, that you show them what's being said, that you draw them Holy Spirit, that you draw them. You said that no man can come unto me if the Holy Spirit doesn't draw. So we know that you're the drawing, not the man, but you working through mankind. So I submit myself to you as a vessel to be used today that people would be drawn to you, that we would exalt you. I want to exalt you, Jesus above everything else today. May you be seen and glorified today. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that I just uh, submit that to you, Father. I pray over my mind. I declare I have the mind of Christ. My tongue is anointed to declare your word. I'll do so with boldness and power and authority, but most importantly, rooted and grounded in love. And Lord, that that word would be seed that would be planted in our hearts, deep into fertile soil where the birds can't steal it. But Father, it shall produce fruit in the name of Jesus. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 9 is where we're going to start. And we'll work through some things. I want to recap a little bit about what we went over uh, last week, but I don't want to stay there too long because I want to move on and go back to some notes we had before. We're in a series called Focus, and we've been in this series for a long time. But today is going to be just a tad bit different when we get into the meat of the word. And I want you just to sit back and listen, but participate, receive what you have, what God has for you. Take some notes today. If you don't have a Bible, let us know. We'll get you a Bible. We'll put some the scriptures up overhead for you, too, if you don't have your Bible here. But if you don't have one at home you can read, let us know. We'll get one into your hands. Uh, we love planting seed like that. So if you need one, let us know. We'll get that to you. Uh, the notes also will be available uh, this afternoon on the Bible app, correct, Miss Erica? Uh, version, and so it will be available so you can go in and take those uh, with you as well. So you version, and if you have questions on how to get that, Miss Erica, would you raise your hand back there? There she is in the back. She does all of that, does an amazing job, and she could tell you how to get it. Let's give them, the whole media team, a round of applause. Thank you so much for you serving us in that capacity. We really appreciate it. Colossians chapter 1, starting verse number 9. For this reason... Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continue to ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. Say, fill you. Fill. Say, fill me, fill me with the knowledge, the knowledge of, God's will. of God's will. So the question I have is, is what is God's will? And if, if you're new here, you probably maybe don't have that answer. But if you've been around a while, you know what we teach here. The will of God is the Word of God. Say the Word of God. So our process of growth, how many you know all of us, we talked about this, are in a progressive and a progressive state of growth? That when, when we accept Christ, we just don't automatically get some kind of just overwhelming knowledge of everything that's in the Word of God, but there's a process of growth we go through that we grow and progressively grow in the things of the kingdom where it begins to slowly, or some people rapidly, begins to change the way we see things, the way we talk, the way we act. We, we begin to look a little bit different because 
every area that we were living outside of his will, we now begin to say, oh, I can do this and have a better life, have a productive life, and have a meaningful life. So we all have a progressive state of growth. So the process of growth begins when the word of God becomes known to us. So the beginning of growth, say the beginning, and you have to realize I, I like to just simplify things. I like to break it down very simple. I'm not going to use extravagant, crazy stuff. I want you to get it. So if it's, if it's like, man, this is so simple, good. I, I hope you get this, that the simple stuff becomes the easy stuff for you. You just do it. But I want you to have this. So when people ask you, what's the will of God? It's the word of God, right? How do I grow? How, how do I grow spiritually? How do I grow spiritually? Well, it says here that you grow with the knowledge of God or the will of God, the word of God. So the beginning of your spiritual growth has to start with now you digging in to find out what the will of God is for your life. Now, you can hear what the will of God is through me. Yeah, that's good. But you can't use me as a, a form of a handicap to where you depend on understanding the will of God for you through me. I'm here to encourage you to have a relationship with God so you discover the will of God, you and him, right? And I'm here to cheer you on. I'm actually here also to kind of help you keep on track because sometimes... We can interpret the word wrongly if we do it ourselves. So that's what the five-fold ministry is, a pastor. That's what we come in and say, hey, I, I appreciate your studying, but here's what it means. Let's, 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 let's not get the wrong thing. So we go in and we develop. We help minister and teach. The Bible says the pastor's like a shepherd, and he kind of watches over a flock so they don't go astray or they don't get all tangled up into things. And that's all I'm here to do is try to help you not get tangled up in some bad doctrine and help you grow in God, help you understand this word is for you and knowing that this word can change who you are to better your life. Amen. So why is the word of God in this growth so important? Verse number 10, so you may live. Simple. So I can live. You say, but I'm living. But you're probably not living the best life. We could still be breathing and not having the best life. And can I tell you, the best life is the God life. Yeah. I've lived on my own. Listen, I mean, I, I know that living in the flesh, we had some parties. We had some times where we said we were living good. But I want to tell you what, all of those led to meaningless destinations yeah. that we're always looking for something more because we were tired of it. Can I tell you, when you get into things of God, you're not just going to get tired of this thing. It's going to be something that gives you life and yeah. encourages you to grow it's not going to draw you and suck you dry like the drugs did, like the alcohol did. Come on, like all the worry and weight of the world. It's something that sets you free and gives you life. So the importance of knowing God's word and his will is so that you can live. It's so you can have a God life. Amen. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. So it's the God life, which is the pleasing life. Say the pleasing life. There's a life that pleases God. And the pleasing life that, that is godly pleasing is one that is lived by his will. One that is lived by his word. All right? So the knowledge of God is important to me as I grow so I can live a life that is pleasing to God so that he looks at me and sees that there's growth going on and that I'm becoming more like him. Verse 10 again, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and pleasing him in every way. Yeah. Knowing his will enables me to have a productive, God-pleasing life. Oh, that's, that's pretty simple. But how many of us battle that sometimes? You know what I'm saying? We, we all struggle with the flesh, but it's good to be reminded there's a life that pleases God. Yeah. And that I need to be putting a check in my life to ensure that I have a pleasing life to God. Not one on my own that I live for me, but one that is dedicated to him. Yeah. Amen. All right. We're moving on in the verse. And pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit. Say bearing fruit, bearing fruit. in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. We said this before. Our fruit is the result of our actions. Fruit is defined by the result of your actions question I ask myself, what 
is the result of my actions today. How am I acting? What fruit is being shown in my life? See, I want to bear good fruit. I want my actions to bear the fruit of the kingdom. Correct? I want that because when my actions, the result of my actions align with the character and nature of God, it pleases Him. But if I don't know His character and nature, I live in ignorance. I don't know whether what I'm doing is pleasing to Him or not. Wouldn't you rather know what pleases God to know I'm walking in the favor or the blessing of God, the open heaven above me pouring out because nothing is blocking, nothing is hindering or grieving his spirit? You've got to know his word. You've got to get into his word to understand because the enemy would try to throw all kind of hindrances in your life. It's not that you're not saved. It's not that you're not child of God, but you're limited in the release of the blessing. Mm. I want to live a limitless life. How about you? So the result of our actions should reflect our growth in God. What a statement. So my growth should change the way I act and the result of my actions. My growth should show in my fruit. So you can look at people's fruit. It's not judging people, but we can judge the fruit. You didn't hear me, right? We can judge and tell whether the fruit is of the spirit or it's something that's coming out of the flesh. So we can put a gauge. And I'm going to tell you, the judging of fruit is not to judge people. It's to help you know how to intercede for those whose fruit ain't quite looking right. There's nowhere in the Bible that gives you the right to judge one another per se like God. We can judge the fruit. We can judge what's going on and say, that's not right. And I begin to intercede for you. Come on now. And, and so judging fruit is not bad because that's fruit. that Fruit is something that everybody can see. If you don't want your fruit judged like that, then you, just, you need to watch what you're doing. Amen. Because no matter if you're a churchgoer or you're in the world, your fruit's being judged every day. People are watching the result of your actions. They're watching your fruit. Amen. Amen. So my fruit should show as a result of my growth in God. Yeah. As I'm growing, my fruit looks more like the garden of the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. So now we can say this. Our growth in God is a reflection of a deeper knowledge and understanding of His will. Think about it. Our growth in God is a reflection of, de of a deeper knowledge and understanding of His will will. How do I grow in God? I need to get a deeper understanding of, of the knowledge of God. Not just knowing the Bible, but applying it that my fruit changes. Amen. Verse number 11, being strengthened with all power. Oh, praise God. So there's power available. Being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might. So here's a promise of help during the growing process. He is not just leaving you to just to grow on your own. He said there is power available, the power of his might, not in your might. Come on, because listen, when we try to do things on our own, we may do it for a minute, but usually we give in, give up. Come on, we go by the feeling, the emotion. We quote, unquote, a season, right? But he said, no, it's, it's not man's might. It's not in what you can do in your flesh, but the power of my might is going to help you grow. It's going to help you through the process of growth. So that means that there's a promise of strength right in the middle of the growing pains. Get that. There is a promise of strength right in the middle of growing pains. You may have never had growing pains, but I decided I grew very rapidly as a kid. And as I did, my knees began to just hurt and throb, and it was awful. And I remember my mom would just hold me and rock me, and she would rub and stuff on my knees to help me. I know my kids... Or go, has gone through growing pains. They're talking about my knees hurt. My, I have to encourage them. Hey, it's nothing wrong. You're growing right now. You see, Eli, he's growing. He's shooting up. He's taller than Amanda now. He's gone through some growing pains, right? He's finally getting some growth. That fertilizer in his shoes is finally working. Amen. That's not why your feet stink? Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's growing. But we have to realize there is might and power, a promise of that, is available through the growing pains. Yeah. It may hurt for a minute. But you can make it. And you don't have to depend on your might to make it. There's a promise of His power. Glory to God. 
Glory to God. Come on, somebody, that there's a promise that he's given us that his power is available during my season of growth. Amen. Amen. So stop relying just on your strength and tap into the power of his might because his might is, is one that can give you the strength that will be needed for growth. Notice I said help during the process. We have a responsibility to grow. And growth comes through our actions. He helps us grow in this process. To be honest with you, without his help, we're never going to be able to truly grow. So if you're not tapping into that resource of the power of God to help you, you're limiting your growth potential. It's like... What's that stuff you put on Miracle Grow that you put in the garden, man? You just, I mean, it's just, it's called Miracle Grow for a reason because it's got nutrients that helps flowers and things grow bigger and prettier. But that's what the power of the Holy Spirit does for a born again believer. It comes in and gives you the nutrients you need so you're growing stronger and bigger and more productive for the kingdom of God. Come on, man. He's got it all figured out. That's amazing. All right, and then we go on. He's given this power so that you have great endurance and patience. Yeah. And I said this before, you're going to need endurance and patience, not only for your journey, but for the journey of people around you. Right? Yeah. Because why? Because you want to give up on yourself. And friend, I'm going to tell you, you want to give up on others. Yeah. You want to give up on other people. Verse number 12, and giving joyful thanks to the Father... Who has qualified and trained us, I use this, who giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified, and I define being qualified as trained you to have the skills needed for. So he has qualified us or trained us to have the skills needed for us to share in the inheritance of his holy people. It's not that he just didn't qualify us to receive it. He's given us the training and skills needed that we can maintain it, that we can receive it, that we can maintain it, and then we can also distribute it to others. That's qualifying. We qualify for something. We went through the actions that qualify us to do something. Have you ever seen a race where racers, it's the first thing that they do? They have a qualifying race. You ever heard that? They qualify. What are they doing? They're saying that my time, and they begin to place them based on the time that they do their laps, if they can't hit a certain time, they are disqualified from that race. They haven't been prepared or ready. Their vehicle or their driver is not ready to race the competition. Correct? It's called qualifying. And see, the thing here is this growth process, consider this qualifying. What you're doing is you're getting yourself prepared, right? Getting things in order so you don't get disqualified for what God has in store for you. Because he can't bless you if you can't, you can't even hold your own finances. Why is he going to bless you abundantly in finances when you haven't taken the time to qualify yourself to be accountable for the gifting he desires to give you? You see what I'm saying? If we qualify for this, for him to pour out the training and skills needed to receive the inheritance. That's a good point. Because we look at God as a hand-me-out God when he's not saying, no, I'm not a hand-me-out God. I've given it. Now go qualify to receive it in your life. You tell the enemy to get their hands off of you. I've already given it to you. You tell the devil he doesn't. I don't have to. I've already told him. He's attacking you. I gave you the power and the authority. Right? Okay. This is good. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified or trained you to have the skills needed for you to share in the inheritance of the holy people in the kingdom of God. Come on, say this with me. I'm in training. training. Look at somebody and say, you're in training. So as we develop, we begin to fit into our role and position within the kingdom of God. Don't try to fit into your role when you haven't been qualified for it yet. Don't try to get in your role and fit in your role when you haven't been qualified for it yet. You may be called to be a preacher, may be a pastor, but don't try to get up and preach until you have qualified for it. You have spent the time needed to grow and develop in the things of God because the last thing you want to do is to be a preacher of heresy. To convince people of things that aren't godly, you'll be held accountable for that. 
you, no matter what the gifting is in your life, whether it's leading worship, whether, I, I don't know, whether it's serving here, whether it's a teacher, uh, whether it's doing anything, I need to prepare myself and develop myself in this role. Yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. You may not agree with me. This is just personal. This is, I, I haven't found it biblical. But for me, as a pastor, it's important if a, pa a pastor has, to, to me, been able to do everything inside of the church, they put their hands to it. They truly, Because then they can truly understand what's going on. They have qualified themselves. You see what I'm saying? And I, I want to tell you, I, I, have, I personally have done the nursery. I personally have been the janitor. I personally have been the lawn maintenance man. I personally have been the youth group leader. I personally, now, not every pastor needs to be a praise and worship leader. Some of them can't sing. But they need to be involved in flowing in worship in some, in some way. I've done the sound. I've been behind a camera. I did children's church. And I'm not bragging on me. I'm just saying I have been over years qualifying myself to stand here before you today to minister to you as a pastor, yeah. as a leader of a congregation because I have served you in every capacity of the ministry that I'm leading. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's why, it, to me, it's, it's important to know the people that labor among you. You, you see, that's why it's important that you know me, I know you, and you know my interest is you. I don't. I do this for no other reason but to help you, help you, and help glorify the kingdom of God. I just want to help you grow in the things of God. That's it. That's all I want to do. That's it. That's all I want. I don't need glory. I don't need fame. I don't need anything. In fact, when I graduated from college, I told my dad I didn't want to be a preacher. Did I? Did I not? He kept on, no, nah, you're called to this. I don't care what I'm called to. I, I, told, I told Amanda, I want, to be in, I want to be in business. I want to make a lot of money. I'll, I'll finance it. I'll help you. I'll give you money. I'll put it in there. I just don't want to be involved in this drama. Church is drama. When you're leading, it's drama. Drama, drama, drama. It shouldn't be, but it is. Why? Because we're all still dealing with flesh, Right? And I dealt with that drama my whole life. I've seen drama. And I just, I don't want no part of it. Years later, guess what? Here I am. No, not drama. <laughs> here I am. But thank God I don't have drama. Praise God. But here I am. I submitted to the call. Right? But I still had to make sure I was qualified. When I knew that I was, I was going to go for a pastoral, I just didn't tell you put me behind the pulpit, did I? I said, give me an opportunity to serve any way I can. Right? So I'll serve any way you want me to serve. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. And not because you're my father, but you're my spiritual leader. In the years drawing up to me becoming even an assistant pastor, I can tell you from the bottom, and truthfully put my hand on the Bible, that I always pointed back to the man of God. I never drew anybody to me. I always, they had a problem, we need to talk to pastor. If they had an issue, we need to go to pastor. I, I was nobody's counselor. There's your pastor. Now, if he wants me to counsel you, he will direct me to counsel you. That's your man of God, not me. I'm serving in the house just like he is. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like you are, I am. I'm just helping him right now. Never did I try to do anything. In fact, when I became an assistant pastor, my question to you was, are you sure? There's other people qualified for this. We had two people that qualified for it, actually. And so I co-assistant pastored with somebody else. I did. Some of you were here when that happened. But I'm all, all of that to say this. There's a progressive state of growth. Stop trying to jump into your position without going through the process. You're gonna, I'm telling you what, you're going to be disappointed, defeated. That's what I'm trying to tell you is God's not going to pour out something in, in your life that's going to kill you. And if you were to jump into pastoral without going through the process of it, it would destroy you. You have to prepare yourself. Because I'm going to tell you, your flesh is still wanting to be your flesh. You'll take on people's hurts and burdens, and you'll take on all kind of rejection. You'll take all this stuff on. Because I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of divorce that happens in the church, and that's the way it feels. 
But you can't get caught up in that. And if you don't develop, that will influence you and it will haunt you and you can't do that. You have to develop yourself. I'm just being, I'm just trying to just let you know, that's what I have gone through. In your role in what you're doing, whether it's ministry of the fivefold, whether it's serving at the door, whatever, you still have to prepare for that. Get ready because not everybody at that door is going to smile at you. Huh? Somebody might say something crazy about your shoes today. Well, my mama bought me them shoes. Well, I don't care. They're ugly. Oh, then you're ready to fight in the foyer. You see what I'm saying? We prepare ourselves to heart to serve as well. Don't try to jump ahead of the process. Sit back. Relax in him. Let him grow you. Stop trying to jump ahead of the process. Amen. That's good for somebody. I don't want to get ahead of God in my journey. Amen. I want to be ready when he says go, when he leads me. Not going, hey, stop, hold up. Because usually when he's like, say, hey, stop, hold up, I done got myself in a mess. Then I'm hollering for rescue. <laughs> help, somebody help. <laughs> I'd rather not have to just talk to God in rescue, but I talk to him in thanksgiving for where he led me into the good things. Come on, that's good. That's good. That's good. All right. I got on that. Oh, da, 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 da. as we develop, we begin to fit in our role and position. Verse number 13, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light uh, of his sons that he loves. Praise God. Come on, we're born again. All right? So now let's develop. Don't just get stuck at just being born again. Now say, I want to develop and grow. Now I've got to grow. John 1.12 says, he gave authority Power and privilege, right to become the children of God. Amen. To those who believe, adhere to, trust, and rely on His name. So, who has the privilege and authority to be a child of God? We do. Anyone who receives Christ, correct? Amen. So, we have received Christ and welcome into our heart. What we do then, we have to qu stop questioning the privilege and authority that God gave us. Always doubting God and what's going on in your life. Stop questioning who you are in Christ. Stop living in fear. Questioning God. Well, God, do I, can I overcome this? Come on, that's questioning your privilege. Am I going to make it out of this? What do you mean? He said that you're more than a conqueror. That's questioning your privilege of being a conqueror. You see what I'm saying? When, you say, when, when your words contradict what he has told you, you're questioning the privilege and authority he gave you. Right. See, some of you say, I don't question God. No, you question him. You do. Yeah. I do sometimes. I have to be careful because every time my words come out that aren't aligning with the promise, I question the authority of the promise in my life. So I question his authority. Faith is not questioning authority. It's trusting the authority he gave. See, faith is trusting the authority that he gave us, the privilege and right as a child of God. So every time that my, my, what I say, my actions don't align with that, I have questioned the authority of God in my life. That is why the enemy has an open door because when you question authority, it's called rebellion. Rebellion is witchcraft. And when we're operating in rebellion, we're operating in the things of darkness. So we have now allowed that operation to enter our life. Come on, I'm trying to help you here. I'm not trying to condemn you, but if you don't see this, you'll be ignorant to it and you'll walk in it not even knowing that I've opened the door of the enemy because I have questioned the authority of the word in my life. That's how the doors open for the enemy to enter your life. You've, all, you've heard that, right? Close all the doors so the enemy doesn't have it. What, what I'm saying is stop questioning the word of God in your life and declare in faith, and it shuts the door for the work of the enemy in your life. I talked to you about the boundary of faith. If you haven't heard that, you need to get that, that message. I know we got it. The boundary of faith. Your boundary is based on the, the faith in the word of God. You set the boundary of faith around you. You tell the enemy where he can come and where he can't come. It's based on the authority given to you, the privilege of a child of God. As a child of God, he's given you the authority and right to use his will. 
his word. Is, is this good? Is, is this all right? You're, you're pretty quiet on me. Is it because it's good or is it because you're like, whoa, no. Okay, just checking on you, man. Because I only got like 15 minutes and I got about 40 minutes of notes. So we just need to roll. We need to roll. All right. So who has the privilege and authority as a child of God? Say, I do. Anyone who receives Christ. I didn't say anyone in the non-denomination, anyone in the Baptist denomination, anyone in the Pentecostal. In the, it's not based on your denomination. It's based on your Savior. It's based on your Lord. If you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you have now the privilege and right to be called a child of God. Amen. So anyone. So let's see here. Bah, 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 bah. Jesus brings peace to you. So this position of authority, because I'm a child of God, one of the benefits you can have is peace. It's a promise. So when turmoil is going on, don't declare what you're feeling. Declare the promise of peace. Why? Because I don't want to question the promise given to me of peace through this authority as a child of God. Yeah. And what this peace is, another word for that is assurance. Yeah. Now what have we been talking about? Assurance. Yeah. See how we're bringing it back around? So we started with focus, but we've gone branched into this assurance. Mm -hmm. A knowing. Mm -hmm. I'm of assurance of who God is. See, Jesus Christ brings peace to you and assurance of who you are and what rights you have. If you don't have Christ, listen, I assure you, you have no rights. The devil has free reign in your life. But as a child of God, he no longer has free reign. He has to be giving permission, an open way to get into your life. So what is assurance? Here's what assurance is defined as. A state of mind in which one is free from doubt. Ooh, that's good. Free from doubt. You know what free from doubt means? I'm full of faith. Hey, if, I'm, if, I, if I don't have no doubt, I'm full of faith. Amen? A state of mind in which one is free from doubt. Here's another one. A positive, this, this came from the dictionary now. A positive declaration intended to give confidence. A positive what? Man, when I saw that word declaration, it just jumped in my spirit. How about a faith-filled declaration of the promise of God to establish confidence in your situation? A confident declaration, it means faith talk, y'all. Bottom line. We talk about walking by faith. Some of you need to talk by faith. Come on now. I'm, I'm, I'm meddling with you a little bit. Get your words out of doubt yeah. and get them into faith. Yeah. Because doubtful words will never bring you to assurance and a confident promise. You'll never have confidence if you're full of doubt. But a positive declaration will help bring confidence. It'll help cancel out a doubtful heart. So assurance means a state of mind in which one is free from doubt, a positive declaration intended to give confidence. Here's where I wanted to lead into that we started, we never got. I told you there's three things the devil attacks. Here's three things the devil attacks to try to steal your assurance. We got into a little bit of the first one, and I want to just expound on it a little more. You ready? The first thing he attacks to steal your confidence and your assurance is your state of mind. You can kind of remember that now? The state of mind. So the state of mind falls under the part of our makeup that is called our soul. Now I'm going to do some teaching for you, okay? It's part of the makeup we call soul. Our soul is composed of three things, all right? So we're a tripartisan being. We're a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. We are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. We're made in the image of God. We're a tripartisan being. Say it with me. Say, I am a spirit. I, am a spirit. I, have, a soul. I have a soul. 
and I live in the body. I say it that way, intentional, because I want you to first and foremost know that you are a spirit. You know well that you're a body. You see it every day. You feed it, starve it, lift weights with it, or don't, or whatever. But you see it in the mirror, right? Your soul, you may not know it as soul, but you know you've got a mind, right? You can think, because I, I hope you can, because right now you're looking at me. I don't know what you're thinking, but hey, and you live in this, you know, you are a spirit. The first thing you've got to see is I'm a spirit being. I have a soul, I have a mind, and I live inside of this thing called a body. But I want to break down this thing called the mind, the soul. Because the soul can be broken down into three parts as well. All right? The soul is comprised of three things. And here it is. The mind, the will, and emotions. Say it with me. Say mind, mind. Will, will, and emotions. And here's what I defined. My, my, uh, it's mind, will, and emotions, or as I put it, Think, accept, and respond. It's how I think, how I accept, and how I respond. Mind, right? My will and my emotions. My mind, how I think. My will, how I respond. I mean, my will, how I accept things. Because I can accept or reject because my will, I have a will. I have a right to say yes or no, right? So my, my will is accepting or denial. And my emotions is how I respond yeah. to situations. Yeah. So our mind is a pivotal key that unlocks the door for spiritual growth. Okay. This is why I put it as number one that the enemy attacks to steal your assurance. Because your mind is a pivotal key. Say pivotal key. It's a pivotal key that unlocks the door for spiritual growth. Yeah. Let's look over in Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians 4, verse number 21. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former ways of life to put off your old self. Say, put off your old self which is being corrupted by its de deceitful desires. Verse number 23, to be made new in the attitude of what? Mind. Your mind. To be made new where? Mind. The attitude of your mind. So your success is directly connected to your state of mind. My success is directly connected to my state of mind. So now can you, can you kind of see why I picked this as the number one thing the enemy attacks to steal your confidence and your assurance? Because my success is directly connected to my mind, to my soul. If our soul is weighed down by the flesh, it will hamper our freedom in the spirit. If my soul, my mind, my will and emotions are weighed down with the things of the flesh, with this world and all it comes with this worldly thing that we have around us, it will weigh us down. If my soul is weighed down by the flesh, it's going to hamper, it's going to try to stop the freedom that I have been promised in the spirit. You can be born again and still live in a hampered, setback, weighed down life. There's plenty of good Christian people who are weighed down right now because they've allowed their assurance to be robbed from them because they've allowed the enemy inside their thought life. Good people. Great people. But the enemy don't, could care less if you're good. It's not based on your goodness. It's based on your authority. That's why the Bible says that it's not based on your works. It's by the grace of God that you have salvation. By his mercy and grace, it's undeserved. See, the devil will always argue why you don't deserve it. Right? 
But see, I thank God Jesus is called the advocate that he always defends while we do. He can never, the devil can never defeat the argument of Christ. I sacrificed myself for that. They don't deserve that, that, that bonus. No, I sacrificed for that. They don't deserve that healing. No, I sacrificed myself for that. You see what I'm saying? He is the advocate. He stands because the enemy is going to come to try to attack. And Jesus, in turn, says, no, I sacrificed for that. I paid the price for that. They don't have to pay it. I paid it. Every debt they had, I paid it for. It doesn't stop his argument. But I thank God the advocate never sleeps. That he always tells him, nope, my blood is sufficient. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So here we go. Where were we before I interrupted myself? Uh, so your success is directly connected to your state of mind. If our soul is weighed down by the, uh, by the flesh, it will hamper our freedom in the spirit, right? The devil has strategically attacked the soul of man. I want you to, I'm about to to bring some things to light to you, so I really want you to pay attention right here. Okay? If you haven't heard anything else, I want you to hear this right here. The devil has strategically attacked the soul of man. What did we say the soul was? Mind, will, and emotions. He has strategically attacked mankind's mind, will, and emotions. Each day he attempts to plant seeds of doubt and confusion in our mind as an attempt to influence the way we think. He tries to captivate your thought life. If he can manage the way we think, he can manipulate our will and what we accept. If he can manage what we think, he can manipulate our will and what we accept. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. If he can get in and he can manage the way we think, he can manipulate what you accept. Yeah. He's manipulating your will. Yeah. He's getting you, born again believer, he does it to us especially. He gets us to willingly accept things that are outside the promise of God. If he can manipulate your thoughts, if he can control the way you think, he can manipulate your will. And friend, God can't go past your will. See, you were all big on, you, you had a will, you could choose right or wrong, you could do whatever, you were big on that. Now you're probably saying, man, I, I don't want to willingly accept that, but we do every day. See, your will, your mind, your will, and your emotions are a huge part of what's being allowed in your life. So if he can manage the way we think, he can manage our will and what we accept. If he can manipulate what we accept, he can now have control of how we respond. Think. Notice I, I did everything right here. Our mind... Will and emotions right here. If he can manage the way we think, he can manipulate our will and what we accept. And if he can manipulate what we accept, he can now have control of how we respond. What did we define fruit as? The response, right? Response to our actions. We should always be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. You will be limited in the fruit of the Spirit you bear if you do not watch over your mind. Because right here, it's showing He can manipulate your fruit. Did I bring that in a way you can see it? Am, am I clear with this? Because to me, I see it. But I, I want to make sure I'm conveying it in a way that you can see it. Yeah. That this is how tricky he is. Yeah. Okay? It starts with the what we're allowing in, yeah. what we're accepting. Yeah. Now our fruit is 
really the response to our actions. So now it's how we respond or our actions are influenced now by what we think. Now you thought it was all about the spirit. But I want you to understand you're a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. But I'm going to tell you your soul is the gateway to your spirit. So what you allow in here is either feeding your flesh or feeding your spirit. So your thought life is so important because you're either starving one and feeding the other. That's all you can do. There is no in between. One's getting fed and one's being starved. But we choose on who's getting the buffet today. Are you, are you seeing? It's not God gave you the buffet. See it as the promise of God is the buffet. You can have anything you want to eat, Right? And then the enemy's got his buffet set out before you. I know I'm talking about food because, boy, I'm a big man. He got food. He ready for you. You choose where you're receiving from. It's not that God hasn't given you the blessing, hasn't given you the freedom, hasn't given you the authority. It may just be that that's not what you're feeding on right now. That's why you're not walking in it. Is this good? Yeah. You, are, are you getting something? Yeah. It's, it's, it's up to you. And see, that's one of the keys I think the enemy plays with. He manipulates the word. You know, he manipulated the word to Jesus to try to get him to get, the, get all kind of false doctrine. But thank God Jesus spent enough time with the Father and, and, and he had enough time that he knew the character of nature of God. He knew the word. So he said, that's not what it says. Here's what it says. See, and I think the enemy has manipulated this thing of the sovereignty of God in such a way that we don't see that we have a role to play in this whole thing. We just say, well, if God willing, he'll do it. God was willing. That's why he did it. He sent Jesus. That's why he said you're a child of God. Now walk in authority and a privilege. He's already done it. He's taken care of it. But the enemy just wants you to think religiously like, ooh, if you don't have it, it's because God didn't want it for you. That's not the truth. A lot of the things we don't have or we do have or this thing, that, and the other has to do simply we have an enemy we fight every day and we have to choose what buffet we're feeding from so the fruit that we have in our life, how we respond to the matter is going to be either according to the things of God or it's going to be according to the things of the enemy. We choose. My mind, my will, my emotions, your spirit is saved. Thank God. It's born again. But that mind, will, and emotions, that's our responsibility. That's that gateway. We still have a responsibility. Say, I have a responsibility. Well, I preached my time. We're going to get in more next time, man, because the que next question I have is how can I make a change? How can I make a change? How many of you want to know how you can change it? Well, come next time. We'll find out. I'm going to tell you how you can change it. We're going to go in the Word, and I'm going to show you how to change it. Amen? But I want to lay the foundation. Is you, you Remember I said you got to change it. Say me. Me. I have to make a change. 